Good morning. I hope you're having a good morning. We're able to do some worshiping in your home, maybe. And we have a Bible lesson for you now that we hope might be helpful. While people are getting logged on, I'd like to read, oh, excuse me, <laughs> my glasses on the podium. While people are logging on, I'd like to read from Psalm 85. That won't be the text for our lesson, but uh, that will uh, allow us to do something constructive while people are logging on. Psalm 85. Lord, you have been favorable to your land. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sin. You have taken away all your wrath. You have turned from the fierceness of your anger. Restore us, O God of our salvation, and cause your anger toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints. But let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our pathway. That's Psalm 85. Today we have planned a lesson that is the third of a series, topical lessons. The first was when nations forget God. I guess a key verse for that particular Lesson was Psalm 9, verse 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Then last Sunday morning, we discussed when churches forget God. There are a variety of ways where churches will incrementally pull away from God. And that causes great consternation to the Father and trouble and chaos here on earth. I suppose the theme verse for that would be Revelation chapter 3, verse 16, where Jesus said to the church at Laodicea that because they were neither cold nor hot, but lukewarm, he would spew or vomit them out of his mouth. And today's lesson is when individuals forget God. Of course, this lesson is really at the core of everything. Churches don't forget God until a group of individuals within them forget God. Nations don't forget God until a group of individuals within them forget God. We cannot change the nation by a political revolution. We cannot change churches by a hierarchical decree because God has given autonomy. It takes individuals' hearts being changed for those things to take place. And so it really all comes down to the individual. When the individual forgets God, there is indeed a whole lot of trouble. First of all, let's notice how individuals might forget God. Just like with churches, it's probably rare that people who know God would wake up one morning and decide, today is the day I'll just leave God after having been a faithful servant the very day before. Usually it's done in increments. Usually it's done a little bit over time by temptation pulling us away just a little bit here and a little bit there. But there are just some different ways that the Bible addresses that people might pull away from God. I think that you're all aware of the parable of the sower that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 13. It's also recorded by Mark in Mark chapter 4 and by Luke in Luke chapter 8. Each of them has just a little bit of different wording, which makes us think that the Lord kind of keyed in on this parable and maybe told it more than once, or that the, the uh, inspired writers were summarizing the things that he said. Nevertheless, there are four main points to it. One, a sower goes out to sow, and some of the seed that he sows falls on wayside, hard soil. Jesus explains later that that represents people who really have too hard of a heart to hear the word of God to start with. So just like the birds would come and take away that unburied soil, the devil comes and takes away the word before it has a chance to pierce a hard heart. That's not someone who goes away from God. That's someone who never was with God. Then secondly, that word, that seed, might fall on some stony soil. And on stony soil, that seed might start to grow. And it would start to grow up 
and do as plants do and start to grow down to take root in the earth. But because it was stony soil, it couldn't really take much root. And when the sun came out and scorched it, it withered away pretty quickly, grew fast, but withered away pretty quickly. Jesus explained, but that is like to a person who hears the word of God and obeys it. But when persecution comes, when tribulations come, they fall away really quickly. That's one way of falling away from God. You know, the devil is going to be after people right after they're baptized, probably more than at any other time that he's ever after them. While they're in the world, he's already got them. After they become strong Christians, I don't suppose he's going to let up, but he sees great opportunity in getting at people right after they become Christians, right after the word starts to take root. So persecution or tribulation comes, and they start to go away. And then thirdly in that parable, Jesus spoke of seed falling on thorny soil. When it started to grow, the weeds, the thorns, the briars overtook it and would not allow the good intended planted seed to grow much. Jesus said that that is like people who hear the word of God and start to obey it, but then the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the pleasures of life, he says in Luke, and, and other cares, I think he says in Mark, get in the way and choke out that word. People just fall away for being busy. People just fall away for not ever having a routine. People just fall away for not ever being committed to something voluntarily. They just fall away and they fall away quickly. Those are two ways to fall away from God. Of course, the fourth kind of soil in that parable is good soil where the seed takes root and grows and produces a hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold, Matthew says, then that's like the person who allows the word of God to be in his heart, take root and grow throughout his lifetime. So going away from God because of persecution or tribulation might be, it is one way that people go away from God. Going away from God because the cares of this world just overwhelm a person is another way that people get away from God. Those two might not be real obvious. At least the second one might not be obvious, I don't think, because the cares of this world aren't necessarily evil. You got to pay the bills. You got to make a living. You got to feed your children. They might be cares of the world that are evil. The deceitfulness of riches is evil. The pleasures of this life can be can become a God, well, we got to be careful about that. And that those things that might not even be evil in and of themselves can pull people away from God. That's one way individuals forget God. Another way individuals forget God is lust. And this goes throughout just about every society that's ever been, I suppose. Some societies start with some godly family values and then they degrade to the point that uh, we kind of are today, that people are just obsessed with sexuality and intimacy outside of God's ordained pattern of marriage. It happened in Corinth in a familiar passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, in a very gross way. The Apostle Paul says, it is actually reported among you. When somebody uses the word actually, it means I really can't believe it. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And such sexual immorality as even the Gentiles won't name. The Gentiles was a moniker for people who weren't Jews, and it became a derogatory statement towards someone who was living an immoral life. And in Corinth, they, they were especially immoral. Around the Greek world, if you became an immoral young lady, you were called a Corinthian girl, whether you were from Corinth or not. It was to Corinthianize someone. Well, here's someone in the church who becomes such an immoral person that it's even worse than that. It's even worse than the Gentiles would imagine or would speak of. And that is that a man has his father's wife, either his mother or his stepmother. Oh, well, sometimes it doesn't get that drastic, but immorality sure pervades us. And it comes through the airwaves, it comes on the internet, it comes through in the TV, it comes in subtle ways. There are hints of it on commercials. I mean, sometimes you have to turn your head away from commercials, don't you? And there are places where if you go to the mall, there are all kinds of things that are up that might cause your thoughts to run rampant towards other things. 
these are these are just this is an immoral world and the devil wants nothing more than to tempt us into that kind of immoral activity that harms us that's one way that people fall away from god the lust of the flesh and another way that people fall away from god another way that individuals forget god is through pressure they want to be liked and it's not just for teens. I mean, we used to call it peer pressure and talk about for young people, but it's for older people as well. As a matter of fact, one of the greatest examples, I don't mean in a good sense, I mean, one of the hugest examples of somebody falling into what you might call peer pressure is the Apostle Peter himself. In Galatians chapter 2, verses 11, confront Peter and warn him that he was in sin. Here's what he was doing. You remember the difference between Jew and Gentile back then. And you, you remember that Jewish Christians were trying to bind circumcision on Gentile Christians. Well, Peter had been the one to go to a Gentile's household and teach him the gospel. He'd been the very first to go and do that sort of thing in Acts chapter 10. Peter had been the one that said in every nation, whoever fears God and works righteousness is accepted by him. Peter had been the one that had come back to the elders at Jerusalem when they were kind of upset about him going to Gentiles to preach the gospel and defended such before them. But in Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, the apostle Paul says that Peter fell to pressure. Let's read it. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Peter was eating with Gentiles, fellowshipping with them. But when certain guys from the from another place came and he was kind of afraid of their thoughts, he was afraid of whether or not they would approve of him. He stopped eating with Gentiles in order to gain their favor. And apparently that had a great deal of influence and led other people to stop eating with Gentiles. Even Barnabas, the son of encouragement, played the hypocrite for a while in that regard. So Paul had to withstand him to his face and rebuke him. What caused him to forget God temporarily? Pressure. People around us want us to believe what they believe. Sin wants to be approved. Misery loves company. Peter wanted to just be approved of by the people around him, even though they were wrong, even though they were in sin. And then another way that people fall away from God, individuals forget God, is greed, pride. You remember Ananias and Sapphira, they were greedy, wanted to keep part of the money, but they also wanted the praise of men in Acts chapter five, verses three and four. And you remember uh, you remember Simon the sorcerer, who was a, a, uh, a magician that had people following him. When he saw the miracles that Philip did, and when he saw that Peter and John were able to pass on that miraculous ability to other people, he offered money to buy that ability. Peter said to him, your money perish with you. For you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray God, and perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. He wanted a following again, and he saw real miracles, and he thought maybe that he could pay for them. And then maybe even get more money after that. I don't know. Pride, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, the same old avenues of temptation cause individuals to fall away from God. Well, what happens when individuals forget God? There's a good verse in Proverbs that deserves a lot of attention. Proverbs 13, verse 15. Good understanding gains favor. But the way of the unfaithful is hard. King James Version says the way of transgressors is hard. The way of sinners, you might say, is hard. Good understanding gains favor. It makes your life a little bit easier. If you have wisdom, if you do what God says, 
you might still be persecuted. You might still have some tribulations, but there are a whole lot of sufferings and woes that you won't have. Look around. Look at the people who are doing things against God's will. I don't mean to sound high and mighty. I don't mean to sound like the Pharisee, thanking God that we're not like those people. No, I don't mean to sound like that at all. But just look where sin is. People generally, generally speaking, have harder lives. The way of the unfaithful is hard. Another verse along that line is from the prophet Hosea, Hosea 14, verse 9. Who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. There's that unpopular truth again for this day and age. The ways of the Lord are right. We don't preach just to have something else out there in the midst of the sea of religious cultural, philosophical, salvific ideas that are there. We preach because we believe the ways of the Lord are right. And that the righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. The way of the unfaithful is hard. Well, how so? First of all, it causes one's own life to be hard. You make some decisions. And that might, those decisions might be sins. And if those decisions are sins, they can be forgiven by God, but there might still be consequences. The extreme is a murderer who wants to be forgiven, but still has to go to jail and maybe even has to go to the death penalty. The way of the unfaithful is hard. People mess up their own lives sometimes, even when warned, because they think they know better. Well, I know better than my parents. Well, I know better than my grandparents. And if those grandparents and parents have been faithful, then those children ought to do what Ephesians 6 verse 1 says, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Or if the instruction doesn't come from parents, but it comes from the word of God, or it comes from a friend, a neighbor, someone in the church who's been trying to evangelize, if you understand what is right and what is good and just rebel against it, you're carving out for yourself consequences for your rest of your, the rest of your life on this earth. It makes your own life hard. When individuals forget God, secondly, it makes the lives of people around them hard. Oh, I wish people could get this. I hear often, I was reading an article yesterday about, well, if, if two people consent to do this sort of thing, then as long as nobody's getting hurt, it's okay. Listen, there's no such phenomenon. There is no such phenomenon. When somebody sins, even in complete privacy, it hurts people around them eventually, somehow, some way. I don't have time to try to illustrate all of it, but let's give a couple of Bible examples. When uh, Ahab well, I don't know if you could classify Ahab as forgetting God. He should have known God because he was a king of Israel, God's people. But when Ahab got real greedy and wanted the vineyard that was next door, he allowed his wife Jezebel to convince him to put up some false witnesses against the owner of that vineyard, Naboth, say that he was blaspheming and have him stoned to death, then took possession of the vineyard. Naboth was a righteous man but he suffered directly because of the sins of someone who had forgotten God. Then there might be what you call collateral damage. I suppose that's a phrase that came to our attention in the age of terrorism entering this country, when people say, well, we've got to fight a war and it's always going to be collateral damage. Maybe that's, I'm showing my ignorance. Maybe it was there before in, in wars everywhere. You, you have this target, but there's always going to be collateral damage. And that's a euphemistic way of saying there are going to be some innocent people die in this as well. There's always collateral damage when there's sin. There is always collateral damage when individuals forget God. I had the father of a daughter whose husband had committed adultery and broken their marriage comment to me, it just steals your joy. 
you don't get the joy that you would have had by close family relationships anymore. You just have to mourn for the sin of someone. You still love that person. You still want them to be right with God. But as long as they're in sin, it steals the joy of everybody around them. I think you might remember the complicated mess that David was in. David was the king of, of Israel. And David was a man after God's own heart, 2 Samuel 14 says, chosen, or 1 Samuel 14 rather says, chosen because he was a man after God's own heart. But on one particular occasion, he really forgot God. You might argue that on other particular occasions, he forgot God as well. You know, in the Old Testament, God put up with polygamy, even though that wasn't his design. And we learn from Matthew 19, Mark chapter 10, that that wasn't God's original design, but he kind of put up with it because of the hardness of people's hearts. Well, David had multiple wives and even concubines, which were kind of second class or slave wives. And that wasn't really God's original design, even though God put up with it and permitted it. So let's, let's get over that. And let's say David was still righteous with God. David had wives and David had concubines, but he looked out on the roof of someone and saw a woman bathing who was not his wife. He exercised his power as king to bring her to himself, lay with her, and sent her back to her home. Then she found out that she was pregnant and sent word to David that she was pregnant. So David attempted an elaborate cover-up. He called Uriah, her husband, back from battle. He was fighting David's wars. He was fighting in the armies of David. And, he, and David had taken her wife to himself. And he, so he calls Uriah back and he says, why don't you go down home tonight? So Uriah goes down home, but he doesn't go into his wife. He sleeps on the porch or somewhere outside. And then David calls him back and said, why didn't, why didn't you do that? Well, how can I go into my wife and have pleasure like that when my buddies are in war, my nation's at war? That's Uriah's point of view. He's just a good man. So David gets Uriah drunk. And sends him down, hoping that being drunk, he'll want to have relations with his wife. And then all the rest of the time, he'll think that the baby that David impregnated Bathsheba with would be his. But Uriah still doesn't go in. So David puts a note in the hand of Uriah to Joab, the commander of the army. And David says to, Uriah, to Joab, in that sealed note that's in the hand of Uriah, go, go and put Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, then draw back from him so that the Ammonites will kill him. Well, that happens. Uriah carries his own death sentence unwittingly to the front of the battle, and Joab puts Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and draws back, and Uriah is killed. So also are some other soldiers that stayed there to fight with Uriah who had nothing in this. See how sin has collateral damage. It had the collateral damage of Bathsheba, although she sinned directly. It had the collateral damage of Uriah, who did nothing wrong in this particular instance. It had the collateral damage of those soldiers who did nothing wrong in this particular instance. But the mess doesn't stop there. It gets more complicated. When David finally realizes his sin, Nathan the prophet says to him, there's going to be some punishment because some people in your own house are going to rise up against you and your neighbor is going to take your wives and lay with them in the sight of all Israel. Well, you know what would happen after that? There's a sequence of events that starts in 2 Samuel chapter 13, where one of David's sons, Amnon, has a bad friend. That bad friend encourages him to follow his lust and rape his half-sister, Tamar. And then Absalom, who's the full sister of Tamar, son of David, kills Amnon. Now, David is mourning because all this has happened, and he knows sin is involved, but you still grieve over your children. And then Absalom is expelled for a while, but when David mercifully has him come back to the land, Absalom commits treason and tries to overtake the kingdom. So David and his men have to leave and Absalom goes into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel in 2 Samuel chapter 16, verses 21 and 22. What a complicated mess. And it's a complicated mess that left a, a lot of collateral damage for people 
who really didn't do anything wrong in those particular instances. I know all men have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's a lot of collateral damage there because of some people's sins. David's, Bathsheba's, Amnon's, Absalom's caused a whole lot of people to suffer. Well, the individuals who forget God still today cause people around them to suffer. There is the ripple effect. You throw a rock in the water and the, the circles come around where the rock pierced the calmness of the sea. Well, that happens with sin too. You throw a sin into a midst of a culture of people and there is a ripple effect. There might be church difficulties. Remember in 1 Corinthians 5, there was that immoral man. You know what Paul said about him? He rebuked the church because the church was puffed up and had not rather rebuked this man. The church was actually somehow proud of having this immoral man among them. But Paul said, when you're gathered together, along with my spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. It's the principle of withdrawal fellowship. That fellow was just going along with the fellowship of the people at the church. He would probably be at every service that they had. He was going along fine and people were just patting him on the back as if nothing was wrong. Paul said, you got to do something about this. And it causes church difficulties. Finally, then at the end of that situation, if I take 2 Corinthians 2 to talk about that man, I know some people don't, but I do. Paul said, okay. He's repented. You need to forgive him. And the trouble was that the church that was formerly puffed up about having this man was now not offering him the forgiveness that they should have offered once he repented. So you see how sin bred sin. I know everybody's responsible for their own sin, but here's this immoral man. And first, the church is puffed up because of it. That's sin. What they need to do is withdraw from the man. And then after the man repents, they're too proud to forgive him. And Paul says, you need to forgive him, lest, lest such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 7. Lest Satan take advantage of us because we're, not ignorant, because we're ignorant of his devices in 2 Corinthians 2, 11, or words along that line. So there was trouble for the church. Anytime somebody who is in the church forgets God, that person makes trouble for the church. That person makes trouble for his family who might be in the church because they've got hard choices to make. Remember Jesus said, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And remember that the family then is going to have to make some hard choices. And then the elders are going to have to do some things that that are hard for them. Remember Hebrews 13, verse 17? Obey those who have the rule over you. In context, we take that to be the elders. Obey those who have the rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, the passage says. Let them do so with joy and not with grief. Don't steal the elders' joy by sinning and thinking, oh, that's just my business. Oh, that's just between me and somebody else. No, there's a ripple effect when individuals forget God. And there's a ripple effect that might last for generations too. If individuals who forget God die in that condition and leave their families to sorrow without hope for them, the devil works his wiles effectively through a combination of sins, a complicated mess of collateral damage and spiritual consequences for the one who has fallen. Remember, Paul wrote about Hymenaeus and Alexander in 1 Timothy 1 verses 19 and 20. He said, I've delivered them to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, we don't know what all that means. We don't think he killed them and sent them to hell. Delivered them to Satan is the same kind of phraseology he used in 1 Corinthians 5 when he said to essentially withdraw from that immoral person. So deliver that person to Satan so they realize that they're working the ways of Satan. 
Paul said, I've backed off of Hymenaeus and Alexander because they're working the ways of Satan. They need to realize it, I think is what he's saying. And then there was Alexander the coppersmith. And some of Paul's last words in 2 Timothy 4, verses 14 and 15, he says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. Paul is actually driven to the point that he's calling on vengeance for this man. And he's leaving vengeance to God. He's not taking care of it himself. So that's a good thing. But may the Lord repay him according to his works. And then he says in verse 15, which I think is the point of mentioning him, you must also beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. Paul had a co-worker apparently named Alexander. And you know how heartfelt and emotional Paul was towards his brethren. You read his letters and you, you have to have that jump out at you. So he would have had great pains over saying this about Alexander, but he had to write other brethren and say, watch out for Alexander. He's greatly resisted our words. May the Lord have his vengeance on him. And then we need to remember what 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22 says about individuals who forget God. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a pig having washed to her wallowing in the mire. There's a bad sort of situation that comes for individuals who forget God. They had everything. They had Jesus. So much of the world doesn't even have an opportunity to know Jesus, but they had Jesus. They were obeying Jesus. Remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 48, for to whomever much is given, much shall be required. And of whomever has the more, they'll ask the more. People who are in the church and have so much, and then walk away from it all. Much should be required. And then we need to know what we might do to prevent this kind of thing from happening. Of course, everybody is responsible for his or her own sin. Galatians chapter 6, verse 5 says, each one shall bear his own load. But do you know what Galatians 6, 2 says? Bear one another's burdens. So which is it? Each one shall bear his own load or bear one another's burdens. Which is it? It's both, isn't it? If I'm going to be a faithful Christian and not forget God myself, I have to try to bear burdens of my brethren and try to keep them faithful. The verse before that, Galatians 6 verse 1, tells us exactly what is meant by that. Brethren, if anyone among you is overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. You try to help people get back from that. You encourage people. Hebrews 3, 12 and 13. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. We need to keep in touch with each other and try to keep each other encouraged. And then... Remember the distinction that was made in Jude. We studied Jude recently, Jude 22 and 23. And on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Then when people come back, we need to rally and daily show them the support that they need to withstand the devil's assaults. And forgive such a one, lest such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. I'm kind of hoping that there are people listening today who have fallen away from God. Not that I hope people have fallen away from God, but if people have already fallen away from God, I'm kind of hoping they hear this lesson and that it might prick their hearts. No, nobody likes to say things that hurt. Nobody likes to say things that are mean. I don't like to either. But sometimes... You got it. Well, you have to teach the whole counsel of God. And sometimes warning people is better than allowing them to just go along and receive the consequences of eternal condemnation without a warning. Proverbs 19, verse 5, open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. 
So I'm hoping there'll be people who are, if they're in this condition, I'm hoping they'll see this lesson. What they need to do is like what Peter told Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter eight, repent therefore of this your wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. If it's of a private nature, do it privately with God. If it's about a few people, do it privately among those few people. If it's of such a public nature that you don't think you could get to everybody else, then bring it to the church. Call one of the elders. Reach out to us here and we'll make the appropriate arrangements. And then if there are people who have never remembered God to start with, you need to start by believing in Christ, repenting of sins, confessing him, being baptized for the remission of sins. If we could help you, we'd hope you'd reach out to us. Let's close with a word of prayer, please. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word today. We hope and pray that it's helpful to people, though it might be challenging and though it might be piercing. We know that your word is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And we know it pierces hearts. We pray that it pierces hearts that need pierced, not ones that don't need pierced. We pray it doesn't put extra guilt on people who don't need to feel guilt. But we pray it pierces hearts that need pierced so that they'll come back to you and have the hope of eternal life and stop causing damage all around them. We pray that you'd be with this church here at Hillview Terrace and everywhere. We might grow, evangelize, and make an impact on this world for good. For when good acts are done, they have a ripple effect as well. Thank you so much for your son, Jesus, who allows us the opportunity to serve you and come to heaven. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We hope you all have a good day. Lord willing, I'll be back here at five o'clock this afternoon with another lesson. Thanks.